Hi, you're listening to Thoughtful Wellness Revolution, where we believe wellness isn't wellness if it's just for you. We're your hosts, Zara and Hien. And before we get started, please make sure to give us a five-star rating and review. Even though we're a podcast that believes in decolonizing, we're still bound to the algorithm. So every little bit that you can help us out, we really appreciate it. And we thank you for all the support. Let's get into it. Hello, friends. We are listening to a very special episode today. Um, So we had an interview with Mr. Ben Jealous, who wrote the book, Never Forget, Our People Were Always Free. And we have a little conversation with him about that book. And he is exceptional, intelligent, inspirational. Hien, what do you have to say about it? I found him to be very warmth. I mean, he is a very accomplished, smart person. Uh, He is an academic. He's a professor. So you would think that like there would be like a coolness, kind of like a heady energy. Um, And there is a little bit in that he's very knowledgeable and shares facts and history, which I love. Um, But he was just also very warm. And I will say, um, I do feel like he low-key healed some of my nihilistic tendencies. Um, yeah, I feel that because I am not a nihilist. We all know I'm an eternal optimist, maybe in sometimes not necessarily the best ways, but this was such, this was a level of optimism that felt so grounded and sensible and practical that I was like, oh yes, even me, the optimist with my head in the clouds, I feel grounded practicality from this, which I think is so beautiful. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a great interview, guys. You you guys are going to love it. So yeah, uh, Hien, what's on your mind though, real quick, before we get into this interview? Well, I will say what's on my mind today is I've just been feeling like I'm doing a lot, which I have been. And so, yeah, I I, I guess that's just what on my, is what's on my mind is feeling like, oh, I've been doing a lot lately and just thinking about like how weird my life has been. And so like I'll say right now, um, I started a new part time job recently and I was just working yesterday. Like I worked really late yesterday. Um, and then this this morning I woke up um, and I, you know, got ready, got some Starbucks um, preps for our interview and had this amazing interview with this amazing person. And I just have this moment like, wow, my life is so weird, um, but I'm really grateful for it. So that's what's on my mind. How about you, Zara? What's on your mind today? Um, Wow. Okay. So you said something really insightful and full of gratitude, which I wish I could counter. But what's been on my mind is that during that interview, so I normally take notes by hand during the interview, I accidentally took all of those notes on the front of my journal, like my leather bound journal. (laughs) So less insightful and cool and thoughtful and like gratitude for life. Um, But, you know, practical stuff. Someone needed to bring me down to practicality today. And it is that now my bullet journal says Trump took Bernie's messaging forever. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's true. That's not a lie. So, yeah, yeah. But you guys will hear more about that contextually during this interview, which you're going to check out now. Hey friends, today we have a very special interview. We're talking to Ben Jealous, professor of the practice at the University of Pennsylvania and former national president and CEO of the NAACP. So Ben, what's on your mind today? Well, thank you guys for having me. I just published a book and it was four years in the making for me. The What I want everybody to walk away from reading my book with is uh, is really understanding what Dr. King was trying to teach us at the end of his life, which is that racism isn't just like the boot on the back of Black people or people of color. It's also a wedge that was intended to divide the people of the colonies of this country so that they could all be subdued and their demands for a better quality of life for their families be denied. In other words, colonies like the 13 that made up this country in the beginning, kings were able to maintain them by dividing and conquering the the members of the colony. And the two largest groups 
back in the day were indentured Europeans and enslaved Africans. They kept rebelling together. And so a new definition of race was created. In the past, it had been tribe. Going forward, it would be this crazy notion that there are multiple human races. And that new definition and the hatred that it uh, helped fuel divided the groups. And it still divides us in this country. I think that we've lost sight of that and that our best chance for moving our country forward is for us to recognize that there was a wedge placed in our society and to simply choose to uh, look past it, to work around it, to work over it, to just, if you will, ignore it and get on with building a stronger country. Wow. Yeah. So well said. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, we absolutely, Ken and I have been raving to each other about your book. It's so well written and um, you talk a lot about cousins and family in it and like treating each other like family. And it really, you have such a way of doing that with your words and with your story while you're telling it. So we really appreciate that. So we're a little curious, Thanks. what inspired you to write the book, Never Forget Our People Were Always Free? So there was there were waves of inspiration. The last one, the one that really made me sit down and focus was the insurrection on January 6, 2021. And the um the notion that we might actually be on the eve of a coup or a civil war in this country to stop such a coup. There have been a lot of casual talk in the community that I live in, kind of an exurban community on the Chesapeake Bay. Lots of Trump supporters in my in my community, including folks that I'm that I'm friends with. They live next door. Kids play together. A lot of casual talk that we were on the verge of a civil war, and suddenly we had a failed coup. And it scared me because a failed coup is the best predictor of an eventual successful coup. Coup. So I wanted to write a book that I could hand to my neighbor, or that I could hand to my favorite uncle on the white side who voted for Trump, or that I could. Uh, God willing, Martin Luther King was still alive today, that he could hand to his old jailer down in Birmingham, the one that was making so little money that Dr. King tried to convince him to join the movement, asserting that they would both be better off, both their communities would be better off if he did. If that man hadn't gotten it by now, you know, a book that he that Martin Luther King could hand to his old, old jailer and say, here, read this. Maybe this will help you understand and I've been having a lot of fun, you know, talking about it. I um, The last podcast I taped was Newt Gingrich's <laughs> before this one. So if I can hang out with Ian and Zara and they love the book and Newt Gingrich and he loves the book, you actually wanted to send it to the speaker. Um, then I think I've succeeded <laughs> in what I set out to do. Oh, wow. I feel like you definitely have because we are, Zara, we are maybe on the opposite spectrum. <laughs> of New Gingrich here, uh, two women of color with a podcast that um, exclusively features BIPOC that we interview um, who are doing um, amazing things such as yourself. Um, so I know that you are the son of a white father and a black mother and interracial marriages today are pretty common. Um, your parents though got married in 1966, just a little bit after interracial marriages were legal in this Actually, country. Actually, before. Their marriage was against before? the law in Maryland. Loving versus oh my Virginia gosh. was 1967. Yes, my oh parents my had to leave Maryland because they got married. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, their marriage and all that all that happened? I imagine that that's so wild that they lived that that history that now, you know, I read in the books and think about, but that they were like there. Yeah, no, exactly. It was not that long ago that people of color and whites were forbidden to marry in many of our states, I believe about 17 of them. And in states like Maryland, if you broke that law, you were not allowed to return. You would have to break it somewhere else. Like my parents when got married in Washington, D.C., like right across the, the line. Legally, they weren't allowed to return. They came back for a party, and then they left the state. And just in case anybody thought, oh, yeah, but they would never enforce that, the way that the reason that Loving versus Virginia was in the courts back then, on its way to the Supreme Court, was that a sheriff broke into the Loving families. I mean, what a perfect name, right? Broke into the Loving family's house at midnight 
in order to catch the husband and wife in bed because the law prohibited, quote, cohabitating as man and wife across racial lines. And while it's hard to, to uh, prove that kind of any other time of day than the time of day people are in bed together. And so he bust into their house to prove that they were uh, living as man and wife. I mean, of course, there was a, a marriage record that proved that too, but, but he wanted the hard evidence, if you will. And so my dad essentially said to my mom, I'm like, hmm, we already got Loving versus Virginia. We don't need Jealous versus Maryland too. So let's get out of here. And that's and that's what they did. Wow. Um, I my I'm biracial. My mom is white. My dad was Pakistani. Um, and they met in the Middle East. They had to leave the country as well to get married because they weren't allowed to. So it is really interesting to hear um, just how prevalent this issue has been throughout society and also just like the various contextual factors that impact whether it be black and white specifically in America you know you have brown and white in the Middle East where that's a whole colonization thing so I don't it, I think that's such a beautiful story that your dad was just willing to be like nope let's go let's get out of here this isn't isn't for us um so I guess that brings us to a question of a lot of the work that you do is really labor intensive, but emotionally labor intensive. And so how is it that you take care of yourself? This is a wellness podcast. We like talking about yeah. how people take care of themselves. So what, how do you take care of yourself while you're doing this work? You know, I, I'm a single dad. I have my kids half the time and like a lot of single dads that includes the weekend. Um, I get them at the end of the week, each week. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and then I have them basically all summer. And my kids love the outdoors like I do. So every Saturday we're outdoors. Uh, you know, they call it extreme sports. I think trying to make it like, you know, like market it, make it attractive. But, you know, we're out there wake surfing and skiing and uh, paddle boarding and mountain biking. And it's great. It's great family time, but it's also just, just a great stress relief. Um, yeah, I also do the work I do out of a place of love. I really refuse to operate from a place of fear for very long. It's not sustainable. And it doesn't, it doesn't put you in the right mindset to win. My, um, you know, I, I heard a, a yogi once say, you're, you know, you will live a better life in your zebra brain than in your spider brain. Spider brain being fight or flight, place we go when we're afraid. Zebra brain, I, they were imagining like a zebra, like drinking water, you know, um, unencumbered by lions, <laughs> just chilling uh, at the oasis. And, and so I try to stay and what that yogi referred to as that zebra brain. My grandmother put it differently. She said, and she's at the heart of my book. She died at 105. She's granddaughter of three enslaved people and a uh, you know, brilliant woman and a courageous fighter, both against racism and against poverty, including multi generational amongst rural whites and urban whites, not just urban black folk. And she would say, you know, baby, it's right. Like, pessimists are. Correct, more often. But optimists win more often. And in this life, you have to figure out what's most important to you. Do you want to be right more often or do you want to win more often? And she'd smile and say, as for me, I'll take win. And I asked her to unpack that and she described life like a boxing match. Imagine if you ever saw the movie When We Were Kings, it was a documentary of the rumble in the jungle, a fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Imagine you're getting in the ring with George Foreman, right? Like you, Zara, you, he and me, Ben Jealous, any of us. We're all be like, oh gosh, like I'm gonna get hit, I'm gonna get knocked down. And you know what? You get in round one, you'll get hit, you'll get knocked down. Round two, same thing. Round three, same thing. Round four, I think any of us, like, I'm just gonna throw in the top. How about that? George, you win. Muhammad Ali, on the other hand, knew that George Foreman had a more powerful punch, that he was in better shape. 
Ali had been out of the ring for several years at that point. He was worried. However, he was a irrepressible and irresistible optimist. So his mind, every time he was like, maybe this is the round I don't get knocked down and Joe Foreman knock him down again. Maybe that's the round I don't get knocked down and beat him up again. And then by the time he got to the 11th round, he was like, guy over there, George, he's getting kind of tired of beating me up so much. I might be able to take him in this next round. Ali had smartly kind of conserved his energy and just rolled with the punches literally for 11 rounds. George was throwing all those punches. He was worn out. Ali steps in the 12th and he says, you know, maybe this is a round I don't get knocked down. And if I'm still standing at the end of this round, I'll win the whole thing. And that's how he won. And so, you know, as organizers, as change makers, we have to develop a habit of being resilient. And everything starts in the mind. All the other good that you may get from, you know, creating time in your life to enjoy the outdoors or be healthy. It starts in the mind. If you stay in that fearful place, it'll be very hard uh, to exercise your body or make time for family, eating well. But if you if you can get to a place of love and joy, keep your eye on the prize, not fret so much about whether you lose this round or that round, but just really make sure that you have a strategy that you're executing against to win like, the whole thing in the end. Uh, yeah, then it's, then it's easy to keep fighting. Certainly easier. Wow. I just have to say, thank you, Ben, for that. Um, I really needed to hear that. Um, I imagine our listeners probably need to hear that as well. Um, I love this idea of what, what you said about the pessimistic is usually right, but it's the optimists that are the winners. And I think like, that's just something that I'm probably gonna think about for the rest of the week or longer. So thank you. And, you know, I say that as someone, and, you know, I've talked about it on this podcast where, you know, I have joked, it's half joking, half serious, um, as listeners somewhat know that I can be a little bit nihilistic as, at times, because, you know, I am very passionate about wanting to see and make the world a better place. Like I, I desperately want justice for all people. Um, I feel very strongly about being anti-racist and anti-poverty. And yet it just feels so overwhelming when we look at sort of um, what we're up against in this world, right? In 2023, there's just so much going on. And so I, it's just really helpful to hear um, your thoughts, Ben, with like all your experience, um, uh, all your experience and all the work you do. And, thank you. Um, let, let, let me just offer you one more thing on that note, and then we'll dive into the question. Um, your Dr. King said something that as you're thinking about that this week, I want you to think about too, which is hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And you know, you think about, for example, the culture of evangelical Christian churches. You might think as a progressive, oh, there's nothing I can learn from them. Except their movement keeps growing. It keeps getting bigger. And you have to ask yourself why. And I would offer part of it is that when you walk into the most conservative church, the most patriarchal church, the most retrogressive in every way you might imagine kind of church if they're growing it's typically because the moment you walk in they make you feel love they make you feel like they've been waiting for you they make you feel like they're eager for you to come back progressives can learn something from that when the black church really defined the progressive movement the heyday of the civil rights movement that was very much our ethos a lot of time, campus radicals are so invested in being right, they forget the obligation to win, and they, and they don't invest in figuring out the things that actually set you up to win. And one of those is growth. In other words, progressives, I'd say our biggest mistake is that we often think logic is upstream of people's politics. It's not. It's culture. People... In this society where so many people are so isolated, disconnected, lonely, a lot of people just go to that church because it's nearby and it feels good to be there. And then their politics shift. 
Does that make sense? And what's the evidence that progressives can do that? The, you know, amongst the mainline denominations that have been more liberal historically, like you know, Methodists, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Reformed Jews have been the only one that's growing. For the last 50 years, they did two things 50 years ago. They put social justice into everything they did. The way they worshiped, they were always going to have social justice at the core of it. And they also added audacious hospitality. You put the two things together and you can grow an institution or a movement that is all about social justice and making the world better for everybody. However, if you neglect the audacious hospitality, if you act at least like campus radicals did when I was on campus, like it's all about the books you read. You got to be totally right and super earnest and always kind of worried and a little bit dour. Like, don't be surprised if people don't want to come back to that party very often. <laughs> Does that make sense? That was an excellent reference. <laughs> um, and this isn't really one of our questions. So I'm sorry if I'm going to get us off topic for just a moment. But since no. you were talking so much about the religious aspect and the community aspect, there is one line in your book that I really loved where you said that you realize we needed a spiritual revitalization and an actual revolution. Um, I, and I was just wondering if that was kind of what you're leaning on with this idea of community and like, it did this come from the idea of like, you seem to be well versed in the growth of religious groups. So is that something that you were looking at and that's kind of how you developed that idea that we need the spiritual revitalization? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think something like a spiritual revitalization or reawakening and an, uh, yeah, I might have said like an actual, I forget, if you can find the line. I don't think I used the word revolution. I think it might have been a revival. But, um, but yeah, no, this, this idea, the idea of the book is that where we are as a nation spiritually matters and directly correlates with everything that comes after that. That we as Americans, um, you know, we need to really um, treat every other American like they're part of our family. Remember in Frederick Douglass, and I get a lot of this from Frederick Douglass, who was a king to Martin Luther King. And Frederick Douglass, I would say his most important speech after the Civil War, and cut me off if you find the exact line, by the way, because I, I can't, I, I, I know it, and yeah, I can't figure out exactly, I, might, I think it's early in the book, but, but Frederick Douglass, um, his most important speech after the Civil War, arguably, was called Our Composite Nation. It was his tirade against the Chinese Exclusion Act. In it, he says so the definitive sort of, he sets the definitive goal for America that has sustained the civil rights movement and movements ever since. He says America is destined to be, quote, the most perfect example of the unity and dignity in the, of the human family that the world has ever seen. The most perfect example of the unity and dignity of the human family that the world has ever seen. However, getting to that kind of crescendo of logic, if you will, and of ambition for America, he goes through his grievances with the emperor of China and the American conservatives who have cut a deal to export every Chinese American back to China, even their bones should they die here. And his basic logic is they're not doing anything that you wouldn't do given a change of circumstances. That if you were impoverished and there was an opportunity to move across the ocean to make more money for your family, not only would you do it, that's how most certainly European American families got here in the first place. So why are you criticizing them? Like, what, what, what? you know? But it started with a presumption uh, at the end of the day that we're, you know, that we're, that we're all pretty similar. And we're all kind of in this together. He he makes fun of the conservatives who like really who thought this was a good idea. He makes fun of the emperor of China. He's just like like what a fool this guy is to think that he owns people body and soul 
and can control them on the other side of the ocean. Now, there's been some news reports the Chinese government may still have these aspirations in weird ways. Um, you know, that they are sending people to knock on people's doors here in America and threatening family members back in China. And gosh, I hope that's not the case. It's terrifying. Um, but Frederick Douglass was, was, was right. And so, you know, I, um, rebuilding America, I think really uh, it starts with us as an American people um, really kind of shifting our mindset and embracing each other out of a spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood and great empathy for the predicament of all of our ancestors or parents who are responsible for us being here in the first place. Um, even if it was just their, their decision you know, not to jump back in the ocean and drown themselves when they were delivered here as slaves. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing all of that. I just find, I just want to say as like, you know, half joking here as a, a nihilist that hearing you speak is very healing for me today. Oh. Um, and I, I want to say, um, I think I did find the quote. Um, it was like earlier Please. in the book is um, you said, what I can tell you is this, our nation is in need of a spiritual reckoning and an actual revival. We think yeah. of ourselves as a nation that makes stuff. Yes, that's right. And then I go on to say, but we've shut down 63,000 factories and da 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 da. No, yeah. that's right. I mean, you drive through the heartland of America, the, the old Rust Belt, much of the Sun Belt for that matter, and then town after town, city after city, the thousands of drug addicts are, you know, people who are drug addicted is obvious. The impact of mass incarceration is obvious. The impact of deindustrialization is obvious. The impact of undereducation is obvious. The fact that there's a disconnection between what they're educating these kids to do and what the actual jobs are in the community is obvious. And you can't help but feel like most families are struggling with the same thing, which is trying to hold, you know, the nihilism at bay and trying to figure out how Junior and Jill are gonna actually do better than the parents did. And frustrations about the state of the local schools. And there's not much, just knowing that a school that's predominantly black is, may have zero kids learning, you know, uh, sort of who are proficient at math, which has happened um, uh, in multiple schools in Baltimore City, for instance, but a school that's full of poor white kids might have 20 or 30 percent who are proficient. Like, there's not much like that doesn't change much. Now, you know, we've got eight million blacks in poverty. We've got 16 million whites in poverty. So if you've got some poor white folks who do a little better than some poor black folks, you still got a lot of white folks who aren't. You know, and as an organizer, this is one of the things that runs through my book. If you're just tuning in, it's never forget our people were always free. Is that numbers matter, not just percentages universities and lawyers fascinated by percentages and honestly i think they they allow rich white folks to worry not too much about their long lost impoverished cousins in the white community because they can just say oh well they're doing better than black folks they're doing better than brown folks and better you know than southeast asians or whatever native americans eh, not really if you look at the numbers, uh, they're the biggest group of poor people in our society. And the ones with the most families, highest numbers stuck in multi-generational poverty. And not surprising that they're willing to lurch from false profit to false profit uh, because they, I think they rightfully get the sense that the Democratic Party, honestly, most Democrats, breaks my heart to say it, they don't really have a strategy for ending poverty you know, or for getting folks back to work. Thank you for calling that out, Ben. Like, thank you. Because sometimes I feel like only Zara and I or, you know, just just the random podcasters on the internet will call that out. So thank you. Oh, it's true. I mean, it's, you know, look, you know, my, my uncle voted for Trump uh, in 2016, I'm pretty sure, because I called my aunt. It was just joining Bernie's campaign. They were in New Hampshire. I would join the campaign in New Hampshire. 
And it was right before the primary. And I said, you know, there's one vote I can get for Bernie. So let me call my uncle. And he wasn't there. He was down at his job at the lumber yard. And my aunt said, I said, I said, Johnny, who, who's he voting for? And she said, oh, your uncle, he's either voting for Bernie or Trump. And I was just like, oh, thank you. I'll talk to you later. I hung up. I was like, oh, vey. Like, she's saying Bernie or Trump because if it was Bernie, she would tell me. And if it was Trump, she didn't want to tell me. And I'm sure he had debated between the two. And why would a man in New Hampshire in the primaries have debated? Because they were the only two who were actually saying to white men who didn't have a four-year college degree that we see you, we care about you, and we want to change things. In all honesty, Trump is just a marketer who was following the polls and saw that Bernie's message so he shifted to Bernie's message. Bernie's message was getting traction with the groups that he was going after. Is not to say anything good about Donald Trump or, or how he helped that community, because he didn't. But it was reasonable for a white guy who, who like makes stuff with his hands and hadn't finished four-year college to vote for anybody who actually saw him, because my uncle had been a Democrat his whole, his whole life, had lived through decades of being invisible to his own political party. You know, and that's somebody who, who, who is a Democrat, who ran for governor as a Democrat, I, it pains me because what it means is this, and this is why you're seeing Republicans peel off Latino men at record rates, peel off black men from Democrats at record rates, and honestly, higher numbers of women of color, not to mention white women who voted for Trump 55% in 2016 than you might expect, which is if you're a person of color, if you're a religious minority, if you're the LGBTQ community, you're a woman, the Democratic Party can always offer you a bomb, an olive branch in the form of their commitment to fighting discrimination. And I believe that it's real and the party feels that in their heart. However, if you're a white man, all they can offer you is a vision for giving you opportunity in this economy, making it easier for you to make more money to support your family better. Well, Democrats haven't had a lot to say since they pushed through NAFTA. I fought against it back then. I poured the country for the AFL-CIO and the environmentalist movement trying to kill NAFTA. And we sounded like Chicken Little. We said tens of thousands of factories were closed if they passed this bill. And you know what? Over the last 27 years or so, all of those prognoses have come true and then some. 63,000 factories have shut down. The, um, but here's the secret. If you don't have a plan to build an economy that will better benefit working class white men, you don't have a plan to build an economy that will better benefit working class anybody at this point. We've torn down the big walls for women. Is there more to do? Absolutely. We've torn down the big walls for black folks and brown folks. Is there more to do? Absolutely. But as far as like net increase of opportunity, like folks are in the economy. Women are in the economy. People of color are in the economy. The walls of segregation have come down. At this point, we just need a better economy. Yes, you, yes. You know, Thank you. Know, you. And, you know, and, and, and a boat that lifts the largest group of workers in this economy, which is white folks, and, you know, and, and the largest group for whom there's no other way to attract them into the Democratic Party, which is white men. Well, that's a boat that will lift a lot of black men, a lot of brown men, and obviously women of every color. And it's reasonable for people to, to vote simply based on kitchen table issues. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. And the Democrats these days have become... Um, inconsistent at best on kitchen table issues. Things, there are good things that have happened. The Inflation Reduction Act is massive. It, you know, flows, frankly, with the vision of AOC's Green New Deal. Uh, it will inject trillions of dollars into this economy. It gives us a chance to really think about rebuilding the manufacturing sector. Like, that's great. The challenge for the Democrats going forward is to make that not look like an anomaly, to you know, actually follow through with a vision for the economy. 
I take over the reins of the Sierra Club at the end of February. And I'm very excited about the future of like, what we might be able to do in the future, because what the, what the Inflation Reduction Act signals is the possibility to actually create an economy where we're building more and more jobs, creating more and more jobs for industries that help sustain the planet to destroy the planet for you know industries that help to sustain families rather than exploit them um and that's you know that's the america that i want to live in you know that's the way that we lead the world um but again the democratic party delivered it conceived it but it's reasonable for voters to wonder is that just a one-off thing or is the party of fdr committed to learning from its sins because fdr made some big mistakes like japanese internment um but get back to you know to doing what fdr did that was right which is keeping us out of dumb wars winning righteous wars and building an economy that lifts all boats and i don't know i just i just hope that's what we're headed back to i do too i i really hope that's what we're headed back to as well um i'm wondering you know what are some ways that you think the average citizen, Black or white, or maybe even just for, you know, non-Black people of color to try to help end structural racism um, in this country? You know, your book is about race. And so, and, and also, especially, I'm wondering as well, this is kind of like a second part to the question, if there is something you might want to share in regard, especially to younger folks, like the folks who listen to our podcast are younger millennials, some Gen Zers. Yes, yes, yes. No, well, um, you know, I am, I'm excited uh, about your generation and the, and the generations that listen to the podcast. I want to assure them, like, every century starts off a mess in America. And every century ends much better than we thought it would. And I have faith that we're on that arc and they may live that entire arc. So I would say to them what Nelson Mandela said to his fellow inmates in Robin Island, on Robin Island, which was get ready to govern. Like literally get ready to take the reins and lead this country the way that it needs to be led it's no more ridiculous to say that to you know Gen Z than it was for Nelson Mandela to say that to a bunch of inmates, and a lot of those men ended up leading that country before it was all over. The um, the other thing I would say to Gen Z is, y'all have way more power than you think. Typically, folks like me, middle aged people, got a mortgage, got kids, got to get them through college, are the problem. We, uh, we're real invested in the status quo, don't want stuff to change too much, like keep my interest rate where it is, keep my paycheck where it is. I've got an Excel spreadsheet, this movie will end out okay if those things don't change too much. Um, but the activists in society always come from two groups. You, throughout American history, it's been the same way. I'm sure throughout world history tend to be the same way. It's people around and below university age, people around and above retirement age. Why? They have two things in common. They perceive themselves as having disposable time. And they're eager to change the world. One is about to take control of it and really wants it in better shape before they got to lead it. And the other one is about to leave it and define their legacy when they do. And so each is eager to get things improved. Now, the older folks have an advantage in the equation when you just look at it from like a materialist perspective, there's more of them, they have more money, they have more votes, they vote more often. However, psychologically, the dynamic's a little different. See, you, it's pretty easy to find a young person that wasn't, you know, it's not ready to follow an old person. My parents' generation, the boomers, you know, their motto was don't trust anybody over 30. Um, now it seems like their motto is like, please don't talk to me if you're under 30. But, <laughs> but you got to remember how they started out if you want to know how to lead them. Uh, because there is no old activist that didn't start out as a young idealist. 
And in all honesty, they are more interesting to themselves if they're following young idealists now. I mean, that's part of the appeal of AOC broadly, is you have a young woman of color who's outspoken in a position of power. And you better believe the checks that flow to her, I would say, are probably disproportionately people over 50 or 60 years old. So to take nothing away from the young activists who are involved in her campaign or supporter, but old folks have a lot more money and a lot more time to write checks. That's just, just, just the way it is. And so it's very easy to find old activists who want to follow young people. And so, you know, having grown up with Stacey Abrams, we were 19 when we started organizing together, you know, having grown up with a young woman named Joteka Eady, I really helped raise her. She was my intern. Uh, her parents sent her to me, she was 16. I was like 21, you know, she's now 45. I'm like, really? It's, it, it's legal for you to drink. Like I still think of her as being like 16. <laughs> yeah, I told your mom I wouldn't let you drink. Oh, right. That was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, Joteka, it was the person most responsible in this country for abolishing the juvenile death penalty. She started on that crusade when she was 16. She finished it before she was 25. Um, Stacy, when we were 20, had a spreadsheet for how she was going to be running for governor before we were 50 in Georgia. And I looked at it and I said, well, then you should move to Maryland. And she said, why? And I said, well, because, you know, like we're Maryland, you're Georgia. Like we'll, we'll get a black governor before you do. I hate that I'm right, by the way. Uh, the first time I told that story since this last election, I said, and then, you know, maybe once you're governor of Maryland, they'll let you like lateral back home to Georgia. And uh, she told me to shut up. And I, I've supported Stacey, you know, <laughs> ever since. Um, and I believe she will be governor of uh, Georgia next time, should she run. I've gone up against an incumbent. That's especially hard, especially one as deceitful and just generally um problematic as Mr. Kemp, who will change every law he possibly can in order to engineer any outcome, you know, in his favor. Um, so, you know, talk about those two Black women, though, Joteki Eady and Stacey Abrams, each, you know, around, you know, between 16 and 25, they were very clear about the change they wanted to make in the world. They didn't ask anybody's permission. They didn't ask how to prepare. They just went about planning, you know, their own revolution, and then um, getting it done. You know, one of the folks, one of the things I've, somebody who's, you know, who knew Obama before he was president and has known Stacey since before she could drink, he, um, people say to me, oh, you know, you think Stacey Abrams will be like the woman Barack Obama? I was like, far from it. She's way more powerful than Obama as a builder of political movement. So, well, well, how so? I said, well, 10 years before Obama ran for office, did he sit down, analyze the American electorate, and then organize the resources to dramatically change it? No. It might have been unreasonable to expect that he would. It would have been similarly unreasonable to expect that that's what a young politico in her second term in the Georgia uh, in the Georgia legislature would do. And that's exactly what Stacey Abrams did. She raised millions. I'm the one who put together the third party report for her to show why that plan made sense. Um, you know, it's, uh, you can do great things, Gen Z, but you gotta, you know, pick a goal, make a plan, and then not let anybody tell you no or get in your way. I mean, a lot of people tell you no, but you just don't pay any attention. You just keep on moving. Like when I told Stacey Abrams no. She just said, shut up. And she kept on moving. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing all of that. I love that story. And I also hope like, uh, I'm in my late 20s. Azara in her early 30s. Please tell us it's not too late for us as well, right? Like, no, this, this no, 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 not at all. Well, right? No, not at all. You know, he and when Stacey was your age was when she decided to run for the, for the Georgia legislature. And then she would run and she would win when she was around Zara's age. And then she would only was in the, in the, there for two years, Georgia had never had a black leader of its uh, assembly. It had never had a woman or its house of delegates. I forget the terminology that they use. And it had never had a woman 
lead the party in either houses, the upper or the lower house of their legislature. And the speaker of the Georgia Assembly, we'll just say, if that's the word, I forget the name, um, uh, was talking about something and Stacey challenged him on a rules challenge. And he was considered to be the master of the rules. Like you could challenge him if you want to, but he would always win. So why would you challenge him? And he was forced to concede from the podium that Stacey was correct. And then you had these black men who had decided that it was time to finally have a black leader in that chamber. And they were all jockeying for which one was going to be it. And so Stacy went and she organized every non-black member. And then she came to the meeting of the black men and said, okay, well, I'm just doing the math here. There's you, there's you, there's you. None of y'all can... And when with just black folks, you're going to need some other people to support you, some other members to support you. And all kind of like naughty, like, of course, you know, and she's like, well, here's your problem. They all support me. So you got a choice. You can either stop, you're going to support me. And if you're quick in figuring that out, then I will give you a great appointment. You'll get the committee that you want. But if you drag your feet, somebody else uh, will decide to support me. Or we will not have a black leader of this house. And uh, they got real quiet and they got behind Stacey. So, you know, Zara, you got way more power in your early 30s than you may realize, girl. I love to hear that. And honestly, this this already was a Stacey Abrams like fan page, but now we're like doubly so, right? So good. Stacey is awesome. She's also the best Spades partner you can ever have. I will never, ever play Spades against Stacey. I will only just be her wingman. I'm, Played that role since we were 19. It always works out well. I I don't put it past her. That's so good to know. <laughs> um, and so what's the biggest thing you would like readers to take away from your book, Never Forget, Our People Were Always Free? You know, I you know, I hope that they'll dig into it. The book starts with me training Dave Chappelle how to shoot on New Year's Eve, 1999. Um, in the middle of the book, I let it be known. And honestly, it's because I discovered it approximately in the middle of the book as I was writing it, that Robert E. Lee is my cousin. And the real sort of, to me, the real core, the soul of that book comes from a story about a party called the Readjusters. They were white men who had been soldiers typically in the Civil War on the Confederate side. This was after the end of Reconstruction, about four or five years after, 1779, 1780, when the old plantation elite oligarchs were feeling themselves because they had the right to vote again, and they saw it just a matter of days before they controlled the state. And they said, and when we control the state, we will shut down the public schools that those radical Black-led Republican governments created without doing the math, math and realizing how many working class white families depended on those schools. And so the white men flee the Democratic Party, which was the conservative party back then. And they set up a new party called the Readjusters. And their name comes from their demand, readjust the terms of the Civil War debt so we can pay, so we can afford our public schools that plantation leads if we can't afford the debt and the schools. So shut down the schools, they say, no, 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 renegotiate the debt keep the schools. Well, my grandmother's grandfather, a freedman, led black folks into that party, it would also be about 55% black, about 45% white, take over the Virginia state government, the North Carolina government for four years. And in those four years, Zara and he and they preserved the, free, the, the future of free public education in those states. In Virginia, they would radically expand Virginia Tech, making the working person's rival to UVA, it still is. They would create Virginia State University, make, creating the first publicly supported college for black teachers south of the Mason-Dixon and quadrupled the number of black teachers in just four years in the entire state. They abolished the poll tax. They abolished the public whipping post. They increased taxes on corporations, took the state from a, from a deficit into a surplus. And they were part of a movement that was demanding higher pay for railroad workers, excuse me. In other words, stop me if anybody ever taught you that Johnny Reb and the Freedmen got together, created a new political party that was pro-workers' rights, pro-voting rights, pro-civil rights, pro-public education. 
but it happened. And then you have to ask yourself, why didn't they teach us that? Well, what came after that was the rise of Jim Crow. And what was more threatening to the rise of Jim Crow than the recent historical example? But what's the artifact that the architects of Jim Crow were worried about that coming back? A couple of things. One, they put the poll tax ultimately in the state constitution in Virginia. That poll tax would keep 80% of blacks out of the ballot box. Would keep 80% of blacks out of the battle box. <laughs> keep 80% of blacks out of the ballot box. Excuse me. It would keep 80% of blacks out of the ballot box. It would keep 50% of whites out of the ballot box. And which ones? The poorer ones. The ones that are most likely to have been part of that multiracial populist rebellion. So I hope people will read the whole book and get that history and understand the ins and outs and think about what that tells us today. Because what it tells us today is that there's every reason to be hopeful that we can actually get folks together and hold off a civil war if people who had fought one, who were literally at each other's throats not two decades earlier, were able to come together in such huge numbers and accomplish so much so quickly. And that's ultimately, if you will, practicing the golden rule, treating your, your neighbor as you would like to be treated. Practicing the golden rule with courage and with faith is actually the fastest way to turn this country around. Practicing that hospitality. And let me be clear, I'm not saying that, that you gotta like everybody. I'm not saying that you gotta wanna go out to the club with everybody. You simply got to be able to pick a few things that you want to get done, like saving the kids at school or making sure everybody has, you know, has the right to vote or that they, we get better wages, whatever it is, and then making an alliance to go get that done for yourself and your families. Wow. Thank you so much, Ben, for sharing that. And I love that history that you shared in the book. I love history. And yes, I am just like, why, why didn't I know this until I read the book until you're, you're talking about it on the podcast. Thank you so much. Um, and just to wrap things up, you know, is there anything else on your heart you want to say? I really appreciate you guys. I, I look forward to listening to your podcast. I think you bring, you bring a great spirit to what you do. Uh, and you guys really are the the future of this country. You know, the future of this country is going to be defined by people who are in their 20s and their early 30s right now. It's going to be de de defined as it should be by people whose parents or grandparents or great grandparents have been born some, somewhere else and folks who have been here forever. The important thing for us to remember at the end of the day is that not only are we all Americans, but Anybody, you know, we used to say that people became Americans the day they decided to get on the boat. My family, the Jealouses, came through Ellis Island. And, and that was the old conceit, that you, you stop being an Englishman, you stop being an Italian the day that you got on the boat. Now you were an English-American, you were an Italian-American. I'm saying you let go of your heritage. Or you disconnect from your family. But America, at the end of the day, let us never forget, was always a dream an elusive one. It was always an ideal, a big one. And it was always a place where each of us would have the power to define what it became. This love letter I wrote to the American people in this book, at the end of the day, like I said, I just want people to recognize that racism at the end of the day is a wedge designed to divide us. And I'm not asking us to, to not use terms of race or, no, I don't care about that. I just want us to actually not let it get in the way of us connecting with each other and doing great things together. Well said. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you Thank so you. much for your time. Thank you both. Yeah. Keep Thank doing you. great things. So this is our post interview with Ben Jealous. And um, I thought it was amazing and I learned a lot and he healed a bit of my nihilism that I talk about and joke about a lot on this podcast. Uh, but Zara, what's, what are some of your reflections? Um, I absolutely loved this interview. I loved the book. 
um, his book, Never Forget Our People Were Always Free, um, because he writes with such a sincerity and an optimism that's ground, like I've said in the preview, is like grounded in reality and it makes it feel accessible to everyone. And I also think it was so cool how he was like, oh, I was on Newt Gingrich's podcast before I was on yours. And it's like, I love, this isn't like a, there are good people on both sides situation, but like there are good people everywhere and the ability to connect with them and build community and treat them like your cousin, as he said, is like so important. And I, I don't know, I just loved the messaging of his book, of his work, of our conversation today. I just feel really grateful. So there's my gratitude. See, it didn't come from my life, but it did come from this interview. No, that's great. I, yeah, you know, I think what's so amazing about him is like, he's truly, and you know, he shares about it in the book. Um, and also, you know, seems like it's in his family with like his parents and what they do or what they did, but like, he's very much an organizer at heart. Um, of course, he's a very accomplished person. I won't lie. I was a little bit intimidated. Like I, you know, I try to approach everyone we interview as like, you know, it's just another human being just like me. But I was a little bit intimidated um, when his like PR people reached out to us because I was kind of like, oh, my God, this person is like, they're so successful. And what are we? We're just two randals on the internet with a podcast, uh, you know, not to like downplay amazing things about us. But I did feel a little bit like that at first. But, you know, it was just clear when he entered the Zoom room that he really is just an organizer at heart and he's willing to t just talk to people. And and I really feel like I, I noticed this when I was like reading his book as well as hearing him talk, like he really has this ethos of um, loving kindness. Like there is a loving kindness quality to him. Um, whether he would call it that or not, whether he realizes, but there is a, you know, spirituality to, you know, what he does and how he talks about these like really tough time. I mean, it's like tough stuff that's happening in our country, you know, with thinking about, racism and race as well as you know poverty and social injustice and all these things um but he talks about it with so much like love and compassion like I really felt that like alongside like just the basic facts and knowledge she had and I just really appreciated that because like honestly that's what I aspire toward like like I'm no Ben jealous but like I do aspire towards being able to be someone like that so it was really cool um and I had told him this before we started recording I've actually sort of been like low key following him since 2016 um, because he had endorsed Bernie Sanders back then. Right. And I just remember that being such a big deal. Um, and and I remember thinking like, oh, this person's really cool. Like, I'm so glad that there's like black people and people of color who want to back Bernie because his message really resonated with me still resonates with me um he should have won but whatever we're here now it is what it is um but yeah I'm just rambling now so Zara and any other thoughts um one yes I think you said it really well where his ethos of loving kindness and care that really shines through and I think uh, his work, like obviously everyone we have on this podcast is indicative of the values and the type of people and uh, like things we believe in, right? That's a given. That's why we have them on the podcast. But I think he did a really good job naturally of just encompassing what it is to be both concerned with wellness in the sense that it is not just what I went, what I ate for lunch. Did I drink a green smoothie? Did I go to yoga? But wellness is in like, hey, if my friend and my cousin and my neighbor and that person down the street aren't able to be well, how are any of us actually well? Um, and I think like you're saying, that's something that really shines through in his work and his book and just his approach to life, which I think was really beautiful. Um, <clears throat> two, I really loved how he was talking about Trump taking Bernie's messaging because like, I think I recognized that as it was happening in the context of the fact that you saw so many Bernie bros being like, well, if it's not Bernie, I'm voting for Trump. And all of us went, wait, what? But to see like there's something here but we don't know what it is but to see him discuss it as in like that is the messaging he adopted to that's who he was appealing to and that's like what that thing that Bernie was doing was appealing to people in the same groups like the same demographics I was like oh like of course it's like a calculated effort by rich people to um <laughs> take on the pathos and the ethos and the work of 
people actually trying to improve the lives of other people to sell them something. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. I yeah, that was interesting. no. I think you're completely correct on that. And, you know, I've thought about it as well. I, I know people in my life, or I should say, I know at least, I know one person I am close in my family who I believe wanted to vote for Bernie in the primaries. Um, at, at the time in 2016, we were still doing like the weird caucus thing instead of just like normal voting, so to speak. In, in Washington State, we now do the quote more normal voting now. Um, but I just remember that like they liked Bernie and like, you know, donated to his campaign, but also ended up voting for Trump simply because they felt like they wanted something different. And, and that difference is, you know, and he speaks to this about like hoping for the Democratic Party to go back to like FDR's party. Also acknowledging that, you know, FDR wasn't perfect. I mean, no president is perfect. I mean, this is still sadly uh, an imperialist country we live in and all that. But like, you know, just that there was there was this ethos of wanting to help people economically. And now that sort of messaging is like, where is it? Like, it's hard to find. It's hard to see. And so, um, yeah, I, I just really feel like. I, I don't know, I don't. I, I don't like, okay, I mean, obviously, I don't like Donald Trump, but, and I, you know, don't love that people voted for Donald Trump or supported him, but, like, I also do have compassion for the folks who ended up, you know, choosing him, because they did feel like there was, like, you have to admit there was something in his messaging that appealed to them in their heart, and it's weird to say that, because you think, like, oh, they're just racist assholes, whatever, just random white dudes, like, terrible people, but, like, you know, I mean, it's, it's like the yes and right, like as, you know, us being two women of color, and us being in the more maybe progressive left radical, however you want to say it world. Um, it's easy to say that and brush those aside. But like, yes, those people are our neighbors, and our family members, they work alongside us. And the world that I want, it also does include them doing well, actually. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that you say that, because like, I don't mean people who are unaware of the racism and the racist systems they're perpetuating, but I mean like actual racists, their ideal world, we don't exist in. Um, like think about all the fantasy nerds who lost their goddamn shit. Sorry about my language. When they were like, <laughs> hobbits can't be black. And it's like, they're not real. Why can they not be black? The Little Mermaid. Black yep. woman, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, well, and then I think about, gosh, what's her name? Dr. Chessie, is that her name? She's a brilliant professor who talks about the way we talk about blonde and brunette and how those are like tone, like undertone racist things because you never say, like Beyonce is blonde, but who's going, oh yeah, you know, all the blondes I know, Beyonce. Lady Gaga I'm trying to name blondes now and I was like you should have thought about that before you did that but um yeah I don't know I do think it is interesting and like that's the thing it's like it's not about having to like be best friends with every single person who like voted for Trump and I do think it's there are I know there are limits and boundaries for every individual and that I think is also understandable but like I don't know man we're all trying to move forward we all need each other we're all family at the end of the day um <laughs> when no no the- I know exactly what you mean it's like you don't have to always be their best friend but it's like if you're interested this is for you if you're interested in organizing and as Ben has said winning right not just being right but winning and sorry I kind of interrupted you No, I love that thing about being right versus winning, because I feel like people are like, oh, you're too optimistic to me sometimes. But it's like, I don't know, man. It's the thing that keeps me going. And eventually I will get a win because I won't give up. Versus if I'm pessimistic, then I never bother fucking trying because I'm like, it doesn't matter. Um, Yeah, I really love that example. And I love Muhammad Ali. My dad was very into him. It's also my last name, which he doesn't know, I don't think. So I was like, yeah, we're getting a Muhammad Ali reference. He doesn't even know. He knows now if he's listening. Uh, We love you, Ben. Uh, Yeah, it's yeah. I I just find that his 
message and the way he talks about these things does is healing the nihilist in me just because you know i i do feel like people who are more progressive who are more on the left definitely are the pessimists who are usually right like i am usually right when i'm calling things out when i'm seeing what's missing right this is me as an enneagram four as well um but i just feel like and i think about you know with some of the things he said i'm like gosh i feel like the leftist on twitter you know like the people online um you should hear what he says because i do feel like yeah a lot of times y'all are right y'all are right and the despair sadness and hurt you feel is valid um but also it then leads to the question and what are you going to do about it and if you are interested in organizing and interested in actually making change and wanting to see change and you know winning so to speak um then i would strongly recommend listening to ben's words and you know taking notes and then like reading the book because he does offer a message and a vision for that if you are just wanting to be pessimistic and right and i'm calling myself out in that like there are parts of me that feel like you know yeah i just want to be right because i know i'm right and like fuck this all you know um I do feel that way sometimes, but then it also leads to like, yeah, and then what? And nothing changes and we're all just going to die and nothing matters. Like, is that really what I want, though? Because no, it's not. It's not. That's exactly it. Yeah, it's it's the optimism. I mean, there is a place for pessimism. There is time when it's nice to be right and nice to do things, you know, like be like, ah, oh, but it's not going to work. There's so many reasons why it won't work. And it's like, OK. And if you don't try and have just a little bit of faith that it might work, you're never going to get the opportunity to really pull through with it. So yeah, I did. I did love that as well. Um, but overall, I, I think this was an amazing episode. I'm so grateful for Ben's time and for his book, which we will link um, for you guys to purchase in the show notes. Um, yeah. Anything else, Ian? I think that's it. I, I think it, that's all there is. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Definitely check out Ben's book. And I hope you all continue to love yourselves and your neighbors. Bye for now.